on EHC. Today this I'm meeting is being recorded. Today I'm presenting on the National Strategy for Implementation of Ear and Hearing Care 2023-2028. Uh, these guidelines um, are in five chapters. We've divided them in five chapters. Chapter one addresses the introduction and background. It talks about the burden of hearing loss. Chapter two is a situational analysis. And so we, we, we did a SWOT analysis, which is going through the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Chapter three talks about the national strategies for ear and hearing care, where we present the vision statement, the mission statement, our strategic direction, and the prioritized interventions. Chapter four is on the implementation framework. Uh, where we go through the goal, the purpose, the outputs for each strategic objective. And then chapter five is on monitoring and evaluation for each of the strategic objectives. I wish to say that uh, these guidelines were launched on Friday when we had our World Hearing Day. And so it was um, quite a great uh, occasion for us as the ear and, ear and hearing care fraternity. So as an introduction, in Kenya, the, an estimated of 2 million people have some degree of hearing loss. This is according to the 2019 population census. And as you may know, this is a really an underestimation of the true picture. Hearing impairment has been uh, rated as the fourth leading cause of disability in Kenya. As the country's health systems and policies move towards the attainment of universal health care, Ear and hearing care should be integrated within the health systems to achieve accessible and affordable universal people-centered ear and hearing care. Uh, the WHO estimates a return of $16 for every $1 that's invested in ear and hearing care over a 10-year period. There is need to gather proper epidemiological data on the state of ear and hearing care in the country in order to establish the true burden and the needs of our population. There also exists gaps in human resources for health and the requisite health infrastructure that is necessary for providing affordable and accessible ear and hearing care services in the country. So this reviewed and updated national strategy for EHC provides direction for all stakeholders in the health sector for the provision of an integrated people-centered ear and hearing care. So a quick one on the global burden of hearing loss. This is on the rise where WHO estimates indicate that 466 million people have disabling hearing loss. And this is as per the 2018 um, uh, estimate, estimates. It is estimated that uh, by the year 2050, nearly one in every four people globally will have some degree of hearing loss. 80% of this global burden of hearing loss is in low and middle income countries. By 2050, one in every two young people will be having a hearing impairment. And one in every three people will require ear and hearing care services while one out of every 14 will require hearing rehabilitation. Age-related hearing loss is the third largest source of years lived with disability. So generally by 2050, the estimates show that 2.5 billion people will be living with some degree of hearing loss. And therefore this is our call to action now. So the broad uh, objective, of this national strategy is to be able to provide a strategic direction for the provision of universal access to integrated people-centered ear and hearing care across the life course. This is a WHO kind of um, guidance towards looking at uh, EHC across the life course. And this is from newborns, the preschoolers, school going children, adults, and even the older, adults. So the specific objectives for this strategy are one, to improve access and coverage to EHC services for the delivery of universal health care. Two, 
to integrate EHC in school health programs. Three, to enhance capacity building and training of healthcare workers for the delivery of EHC services. Four, to accelerate ear and hearing care services through collaboration with uh, stakeholders. And during our uh, technical working group, or the technical working group that uh, was working in, uh, toward developing this document um, was a multi-sectoral one. So we had the Ministry of Health, uh, the Ministry of Education, NGOs, uh, private hospitals, the academia, universities, University of Nairobi, Kenyatta University, teaching and referral. We also had a Kenya Medical Training Center, uh, we also had the council, council of Governors represented. So we had a multi-stakeholder meeting. Uh, number five specific objective is to strengthen habilitation and rehabilitation services for children and adults with hearing disability while leveraging on technology. And number six is to operationalize research, monitoring and evaluation mechanisms for evidence-based decision-making. Justification for the strategy, number one, was we reviewed the 2016-2020 strategic plan and aligned it with the Ministry of Health's strategic direction on attainment of uh, universal health care. Number two was we adopted the World Report on Hearing recommendations. The World Report was released in uh, 2021. So we adapted uh, uh, the recommendations there, which were threefold. Number one, to prevent hearing loss through cost-effective, accessible public health interventions. Number two is to provide systematic hearing screening for individuals across the life course. That is from newborns and infants, uh, the preschool and school age children, uh, people who are exposed to noise or chemicals at work, and people receiving autotoxic medication in older adults in order to prevent hearing disability. And thirdly, to prevent hearing disability by adequate habilitation and rehabilitation. This refers to uh, instruments such as hearing aids and cochlear implants, middle ear implants, et cetera, thus allowing for the persons living with disabilities, and in this case, the hearing disability, to engage in economic activities for nation building. So that's what uh, chapter one of this uh, strategic plan covers. Chapter two is a situational analysis. Kenya is striving to attain the sustainable development goals among them, the universal health coverage by the year 2030. The existing gaps in the provision of EHC services in the country that needed to be strengthened scaled up and integrated into primary health care to ensure provision of universal ear and hearing care to individuals across the life course were identified in this situational analysis. So we conducted a SWOT analysis, which we are going to go through. So we looked at strengths and one of the strengths we identified was political goodwill. The implication of this being that support and integration of the strategy and guidelines can now happen. And so we are going to, our response will be to take advantage of the existing political goodwill so as to be able to implement or uh, rather to roll out the strategy. There are also uh, the pre-existing pre national strategy for guidelines, the ones of the uh, 2016-2020. So we have built on this and improved on it. Uh, we have revised, uh, developed, and updated the existing document. And then the presence of a national technical working group, um, that has been a, a great strength. Uh, this group uh, will oversee the smooth implementation and the rollout of the national ear and hearing care strategy. Uh, and then we have the dedicated, a dedicated focal person, who is in charge of ear and hearing care at the Ministry of Health, and that is uh, Mr. Manasse Bocha. And with him, he has a team, a secretariat, has a, that is Badad and Perez Wawire, 
The implication of this is that you'll have, we'll have informed coordination and follow-up of EHC activities at the national level. And um, uh, the response will be to ensure that efficient coordination and communication between the technical working group and the national government actually happens. So some of our weaknesses that were identified were delayed implementation of existing policies, strategy and guidelines that is of the previous strategy. Um, and um, the, it, it was a, the case that the existing strategy was not widely disseminated or implemented. And that's why even the title of our current strategy is uh, focusing on the actual implementation. We want to ensure that these uh, new guidelines are uh, implemented. Then the other weakness being inadequate resources to implement the existing EHC strategy and the guidelines. So this uh, has led to the delay in the rollout, uh, the implementation of the EHC previous EHC strategy. And so our response is to do resource mobilization so that we ensure that uh, these current ones are implemented, current strategy and guidelines are implemented. So there's also lack of uh, locally available infrastructure to support technology for management and rehabilitation of hearing services uh, with uncertainties in the supply, maintenance and high cost of technical technology in EHC. So our response will be to ensure the establishment of a center of excellence for innovation innovation, research, assembly, and local manufacture of technology for ear and hearing care. What are the opportunities that uh, we identified? Avail One was availability of partners. And so the implication of this being that we'll be able now to achieve our goals and objectives for EHC. And uh, we'll continue to foster strong multi-sectoral partnerships in supporting EHC projects. Then we have the uh, other opportunity being availability of training institutions in EHC. And uh, the implication of this means that we will have adequate human uh, resource for EHC, which is a critical component of this particular strategy. And in line with uh, even the WHO um, direction, particularly for this World Hearing Day, uh, where they launched a manual for primary healthcare uh, workers in EHC, uh, which uh, I can invite you to just um, Google and get onto the WHO website and you'll be able to see that training manual. So we want to provide, we have institutions that uh, we can work with to be able to uh, train EHC at all levels of healthcare, primary, uh, secondary, tertiary, and even at the community level. Uh, the other opportunity is uh, devolution. So devolution of health services and existing organizational health structures in the county levels. This uh, allows for increased access to EHC. So we're going to take advantage of the devolved healthcare structures through continuous communication and engagement in order to improve access to ear and hearing care. And there is also the existing good infrastructure for delivery of EHC these roads, internet connectivity, and physical buildings. So this will provide or provide uh, improved accessibility and coverage for the implementation, uh, monitoring, and evaluation of EHC. This aspect of monitoring and evaluation is comes out very strongly in our uh, current strategic plan as compared to the previous one. So we'll maximize on the existing infrastructure to effectively roll out EHC. So the threats that are, are potential threats are political uncertainty, which uh, had led now to stalled EHC programs. Um, and the response to that is uh, we just adapt to the change uh, in political structures. And also the other threat being social cultural misconceptions, pan pandemics, and other public health emergencies, such as drought and uh, climate change, which then shifts focus. Uh, so the response to this is really to have an uh, integration of greater community awareness strategies in ear and hearing care. That one will help um, in the negative attitude that may be there towards implementation of EHC. And then uh, 
where you have uh, all these other competing uh, needs, um, a change of government policies within the health system. That's what the implication of that. So our response to that will be having continuous lobbying for EHC and engagement of relevant uh, stakeholders. So that's the end of chapter two, which was on a situational analysis. We are looking at the SWOT, looking at the implication of each of those, and then our response to that. Chapter three addresses the national strategy for EHC, where we are going to talk about the vision, mission, and strategic directions. So the Kenya national strategy for ear and hearing care is built on a foundation of vision, a mission, goal, and specific objectives. The vision is to have an integrated, people-centered ear and hearing care throughout the life course of an individual. The mission is to provide quality, affordable, and accessible ear and hearing care services to all citizens in Kenya without uh, causing them to suffer financial hardship. Uh, the strategic directions are one, to have an establishment of ear and hearing care clinics with at least one for every sub-county in the country. Two, to have the establishment of an ear and hearing care wellness centers for screening of ear and hearing abnormalities in maternity units. Three, to have integration of EHC in school health programs. Four, to have sensitization, capacity building, and training of healthcare workers on early diagnosis and the essentials of ear and hearing care. Five, collaboration with key partners and stakeholders for the delivery of EHC programs in the country. And six, to operationalize monitoring and evaluation mechanism with key indicators for evidence-based decision-making. This is a very key component of uh, this uh, current strategic plan as it wasn't uh, quite clearly laid out in the previous uh, plan. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things we have had to do is develop uh, key indicators to be able to monitor and evaluate um, the strategy in the, in the next five years. So uh, we did an analysis and uh, got out some prioritized interventions that we want to take. And these are along the health system pillars and one being leadership and governance. So the gaps that we identified there, and these are only some of the um, gaps that were identified. So for each one of these, I'm just going to pick on a few of the gaps that we uh, identified and the actions that we are going to take to address those gaps. But as you will see in the document itself, there are very many other gaps that were identified. But with that, along with that, we also uh, put up the action plan for the same. So uh, in leadership and governance, the, one of the gaps is lack of an EHC focal person, EHC champions in the county level. So the action point will be to identify and appoint focal persons or champions to drive the EHC agenda in the counties, given now that we are in a health is a devolved function. So then there was the lack of proper documentation of EHC data. Uh, the action will be to establish a monitoring and evaluation framework to implement EHC at all levels of service delivery. And we have developed this in this new strategy. Some very key um, information uh, around EHC was missing. Uh, for example, all it would talk about, uh, it was just probably ear infection and uh, not having a place to document uh, for hearing, for example. So the other um, health pillar is health financing for EHC. The gaps, one of the gaps we identified was inadequate healthcare financing system to ensure access to high impact, cost-effective and preventive EHC interventions. So the action will be to increase resource mobilization for EHC through new partners in EHC and also an enhanced contribution of private 
and development partners. The other pillar is health service delivery. Some of the gaps we identified was a lack of indicators for screening and identifying risk factor for hearing loss. Uh, for example, in newborns, we were looking at the booklet, the mother-child booklet, uh, and the only thing that uh, is picked up there in the booklet is just um, ears. So there is, we are now developing more questions or indicators that can be put in the booklet and that is around the area of hearing. So developing indicators for screening and identifying risk factors for hearing loss. So also another gap being lack of structures for universal newborn hearing screening. And um, that for that we are developing a structure for hospital-based uh, universal newborn hearing screening. Other areas that uh, where we identified gaps were in a school-based hearing screening program, monitoring for autotoxicity and uh, noise-induced hearing loss. And for each, there is an action plan, as you will see in the actual strategy. Uh, on human resource for health, we identified uh, one of the gaps we identified was an inadequate basic knowledge among healthcare workers across all levels of healthcare. And so therefore the action point will be to train, have training on EHC and continuous medical education for healthcare workers at all levels of care. And uh, then um, regarding health information systems, the gaps that were identified were lack of compatibility of different health information systems at the same facility, as well as up and down referral. So the action for that will be development of a module for EHC that can be utilized at service delivery points in the digital health platform. Uh, the other gap in uh, health information systems was a lack of ear and hearing items assessed in the mother and child uh, health booklet that we talked about and MCH register during newborn and early childhood service delivery. So the action will be to develop indicators based on the levels of service provision and data collection capabilities to be integrated into the health information system. On uh, health products and technologies, we identified uh, that there was a lack of itemized list of hearing devices this we are talking about uh, hearing aids and cochlear implants, middle ear implants, bone conduction, uh, hearing aids, and their uh, specifications that are required for rehabilitation and habilitation. So the action towards this is a provision of an itemized list of the uh, different types of hearing aids, behind the ear hearing aids, receiver in the canal hearing aids, completely in the canal hearing aids, and the models of uh, uh, hearing aids, hearing devices, such as cochlear implants and their accessories and specifications. On uh, EHC health infrastructure, we identified uh, several gaps. I'll just mention two. There's lack of appropriate infrastructure at all levels of EHC. And the action is to set up at least one EHC clinic in each sub-county a total of 295 throughout the country. And the other gap was a lack of EHC screening centers in the community. And so we'll ensure formation of community ear and hearing care screening centers. On research, uh, the gaps were an inadequate funding for research activities and um, also inadequate local data to inform policy and EHC activities. So an action point towards that will be to identify priority areas for research on EHC and to translate now this quality evidence into affordable health technologies and evidence uh, informed policies. That is the end of chapter three. Chapter four now is on the actual implementation, uh, a multi-sectoral approach involving all stakeholders is necessary for a successful implementation of this strategy. Partners will need to work together through information sharing, adoption of innovative approaches, avoidance of conflict of interest, 
and also avoidance of duplication of efforts in order for us to maximize the use of available resources. So in the document, we have then outlined uh, the various stakeholders and their specific roles and responsibilities. So we have uh, the national government, which is there to provide an enabling environment for the implementation of key activities in the EHC strategic plan. Then we have the county governments, which will also implement the strategic plan and guidelines for EHC. We have development partners, and uh, they are, you know, some of their roles and responsibilities are to place ear health and hearing loss on the global public health agenda. We have the private sector, the non-governmental organizations, the faith-based uh, organizations, community-based organizations who will participate in the provision of ear and hearing care. And then we have other stakeholders in education, training, and research institutions. And uh, their role will be to review and integrate EHC in the existing curriculum in their institutions, and also to train competent and skilled human resource for ear and hearing care across all the various levels of healthcare. Then professional associations, uh, their role and responsibility will be to conduct research and uh, share their findings in order to inform policy, also to establish centers of excellence in the national referral facilities. Then we have uh, importantly stakeholders uh, that is the individuals, their families and communities. So they observe uh, preventive and promotive healthcare practices and also timely seeking of healthcare. A very important stakeholder is media and uh, they came through for us, especially this time of uh, when we were commemorating World Hearing Day on the 3rd of March. They are very um, important, but uh, in terms of advocacy and communication, the media. Yeah. So in the implementation framework, uh, there are very many different uh, strategies. So I'm just going to pick up on one of them. Uh, so the broad objective here is to address strategic direction for uh, provision of universal access to integrated people-centered ear and hearing care across the life course. So I've picked on one strategic objective, and that is number four, strategic objective number four, uh, which is to accelerate ear and hearing services through collaboration with stakeholders. So we subject now this uh, particular objective through this matrix, where we have a, an activity, an output, and then the expected outcome. And then we have key performance indicator. Uh, then we have the lead agency. Then we have the source of the data. And then we have uh, the frequency of data collection, a budget for it, and the timelines. So in this one, one of the activities, and this is, uh, going to be our next steps, our next immediate activity is to disseminate the reviewed uh, EHC strategic plan and implementation guidelines. So the output for that will be to have disseminated the reviewed EHC strategic plan and implementation guidelines. The outcome we expect is an increased uptake of EHC services in counties across Kenya. The key performance indicators being the number of counties that have implemented the, the designated strategic plan and guidelines, the lead agency being MOH, the source of data is the dissemination plan, the frequency of data collection is quarterly, the budget is uh, 5 million, and the timelines are uh, the five-year plan every year, 22. 23, 24, and so forth up until 2027, 2028. So for every strategic objective, we outline it, and then we look at the activities that are going to help us to achieve that objective. And then we have this uh, whole matrix for each of the activity. Uh, 
Okay. Then uh, the final chapter is monitoring and evaluation plan. Uh, once again, I'm just going to pick on one of the strategic objectives and uh, then uh, how it will appear or how it appears on the monitoring and evaluation plan. So I pick on the uh, strategic objective, which is to provide uh, leadership and governance for ear and hearing care services at all levels of government. So we looked at the impact this will have, which is effective leadership and governance framework for ear and hearing care services at all levels of government. Uh, the first outcome we expect is improved leadership and uh, governance framework for EHC services at the national and county levels. The key performance indicator uh, for this outcome uh, is the number of counties implementing the EHC strategy and guidelines. As a baseline, uh, we are starting from zero. We target all the 47 counties. And so we'll see uh, along the years uh, how may, what we'll achieve. Uh, the lead agency is the national and county technical working groups. The source of data was coming from the technical working group in each county. The frequency of data collection is quarterly. And so um, we will do it across those, the years 2023, 2024. Evaluation usually will uh, be done midterm and at the end. Uh, and then the output is disseminated the having disseminated the reviewed EHC strategic plan and implementation guidelines. So uh, performance indicators here would be the number of counties that have adopted the disseminated strategic plan and implementation guidelines and baseline being a zero target being 47 counties countrywide, the lead agency, uh, the MOH, the source of data, the dissemination plan and the frequency of data collection quarterly. And uh, this we are uh, going to, hoping to achieve 2023, 24, and 24 to 25. Uh, so this is how the monitoring and uh, evaluation metrics looks like. And uh, that is the last chapter. And uh, this is just, I think, nearly all the members of our technical working group that uh, was led by Mr. Manasse Bocha. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, next up in the interest of time is uh, Mr. Manasse. Mr. Manasse, I think I'll just share the, the screen for you. You had given me your, your, your session, so take us away. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, we can continue. Next slide. The Minister of Health launched, uh, as we have heard from Sarah, the hearing policies, uh, hearing policy strategies, and protocols in 2016, 2016 2020. Uh, this plan was uh, okay. Okay, thank you. So when we developed uh, the, our strategy and uh, protocols and guidelines in 2016, it so happened that we were one of the few countries in Africa and uh, in our region to have developed uh, at least a comprehensive strategy and policy guidelines for our country. And uh, it was picked by the uh, World uh, Health Organization, especially in their World Health Report, as a case study of our country's response to a resolution in 2017 at the World uh, Health Assembly uh, as a base study of our country's response on implementation of a resolution 71.13 uh, on prevention of hearing loss and deafness. Next. As we have heard from uh, uh, Sarah, 1.5 billion people uh, today globally live with some degree of hearing loss. 
And it is estimated that 460 million people worldwide, 135 million in Africa and 2 million Ken Kenyan suffer some degree of disabling. And when you talk about disabling hearing loss, we are talking about moderate to severe hearing loss. And this is expected to rise to uh, 2.5 billion by 2050. In fact, by 2050, uh, it is, a, it, we are, it is a, it's estimated that one in every four people globally will have some degree of hearing loss. And uh, by that time, 700 million will require rehabilitation. Next. Today, we know most hearing loss is preventable through cost effective and accessible public health interventions. And technological advan advances have has offered tools to identify ear diseases and hearing loss early enough, like uh, autoacoustic emission bearer. Those are advances which can help us to identify uh, hearing losses, hearing loss and disease very early. And we know systematic hearing loss, uh, systematic hearing screening across life course. Uh, in newborn babies, infants, preschool and school and children, uh, people exposed to noise uh, 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 and all chemicals at work and people receiving autotoxic medicine and older children can be identified through systematic hearing screening across the life course. And uh, from the lessons that we learned, uh, when we developed the strategy and guidelines in 2016, 2020, these guidelines expired and uh, they had not received wider dissemination. And uh, the main reason was that we, we didn't have a steering committee of uh, the Minister of Health uh, being involved uh, to a large extent in terms of implementation. Therefore, this time around, the Ministry of Health decided to appoint a technical working group for ear and hearing uh, care. First of all, to review, next slide, to review the guidelines, and number two, to ensure uh, implementation. Next slide. Therefore, the technical working group, uh, working group uh, which was uh, appointed in 2022, uh, managed to review the 2016-2020 guidelines and uh, the guidelines and the strategy were launched on the 3rd of March, that is last Friday during the World Hearing Day. And now the next step is to ensure they are disseminated uh, widely. And uh, part of the strategies which uh, Sarah presented in the earlier presentation is to ensure that we establish ear and hearing care uh, clinics at least one for every sub-county. We have about 294 sub-counties in the country, and uh, the desire is by the time, if the time five years are over, at least every sub-county has one ear and hearing care center. Then is, uh, the other strategy is to ensure establishment of, of preventive and promotive wellness center for every maternity or labor ward and labor ward uh, for screening of congenital ear and hearing care abnormalities. Next. We also like to ensure formation of community ear and hearing care screening. Therefore, screening for ear and hear conditions would like it to start from the community level. The community health workers can be trained on simple way, uh, techniques and ways of uh, identifying ear conditions very early, like for example, the use of a shaker, the use of uh, clicking of uh, uh, the fingers to have an estimation whether somebody is able to hear normally or they have some degree of hearing loss. We, we would also like to ensure establishment of ear and hearing care clinics or uh, centers for schools. We'd like to train uh, health work, healthcare workers on early diagnosis and the essentials of ear and hearing Care, including doctors, clinical officers, nurses, and midwives. We would also like to uh, train the community health workers. Then let's go next slide. Then for a long time, we didn't have a comprehensive list of ear and hearing care commodities in the Kenya Essential Medicines uh, list. 
but this time around, the technical working group uh, managed to have uh, put the list last year, 2022, the Minister of Health uh, I re I began the work of reviewing the uh, Kenya Essential Medicines and Supplies List 2022, and we managed to include our commodities in the in the Kenya Essential Medicines List. Therefore, it means when when counties are ordering commodities from Kemsa, they are able also to access ear and hearing care commodities. We would like also to develop a comprehensive monitoring and evaluation mechanism, which we saw uh, from the uh, previous presentation, and also collaborate with our partners, uh, available partners, so that we can take this agenda of ear and hearing care to the next level. Next. Therefore, today, in, in, to, this, to this audience, we would like to present the ear and hearing strategy uh, and guidelines 2023-2028 uh, for all of us to be uh, walking the same talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Manasse, for that brief, comprehensive summary of what uh, the technical working group and, in general, what the ministry has been doing uh, to shed light on uh, ear and hearing care. Uh, next is Dr. Lillian. Dr. Lillian, how are you? Hi, hi, Amina. I'm fine, thank you. Fine, fine. Can fine. you hear me? Yes, we can. Karibu sana, Dr. Yeah, well, welcome to continue with the presentation. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Lillian Moko. I am an ENT surgeon based at uh, Kenyatta University, teaching research and referral hospital, or re teaching referral and research hospital. Sorry about that. I'm also a member of the technical working group on ear and hearing care appointed by the Ministry of Health. Today, I'll be presenting for you the implementation guidelines for ear and hearing care in 2023-2028. These implementation guidelines, as an introduction, they are a revision of the previous policy guidelines. The policy guidelines were developed between 2016, for the year 2016-2020. And um, they, and so, our guidelines are a, it is a document that is supposed to be accompanying the national strategy for ear and hearing care because it is a guide on how the the the, the plan or how the strategy is going to be implemented now these guidelines are um, tuned in line with the world report on hearing 2021 and the recommendations given by who on that day they're going to provide a standardized way of managing ear and hearing conditions in the country start coming all the way from the infrastructure that is required all in all the levels of care that is the health care system and in the community so we also hope that these guidelines will be utilized by healthcare workers in the various health uh, healthcare facilities, and it will help them to understand the issues and how to manage basic ear and hearing problems, especially in the primary healthcare level. So the objectives are in line with the objectives of the strategy. As I said, this is a document that is to accompany the strategy for purposes of implementation. So it has guidelines for the community, guidelines for stakeholders, guidelines for the county, guidelines for the various level of care in the various healthcare facilities, and guidelines for the civil society. This is a, a brief on the burden of disease. And I'm sure my the previous presenters have been very clear on the burden of disease. Just to emphasize, we just noticed that there are various issues that are priority issues. And these the priority areas are mainly um, focused on the global action to upscale ear and hearing services by, by 20% in 2030. So our, our targets, Say, as set by the World Health Organization, are a 20% increase in the coverage of uh, newborn hearing screening and also childhood early screening, 20% increase in the coverage of adults with hearing loss 
in their rehabilitation and in their use of technology, and a 20% drop in the cases of chronic ear diseases and unaddressed hearing loss in children, especially between five to nine years. We know that 60% uh, of childhood hearing loss is mainly as a result of the ear infections. So that is why we have this uh, particular guidance. And we also know that 60% of ear and hearing care can be ear and hearing conditions can be addressed at a primary health care level. Issues such as noise-induced hearing loss that cause re irreversible permanent deafness are things that can be changed by use of a public health approach just by screening and uh, advocacy programs. So that is why we are advocating for ear and hearing care to be um, to be delivered in the primary health care setup, most of these interventions are going to at least capture or prevent 60% of the avoidable causes of deafness. So the public health interventions are for achieving the integrated people-centered ear and hearing care, which has been highlighted by my, um, by my colleagues before, is a uh, 60, so the public health interventions outlined by WHO are described in an acronym hearing. So the, the guidelines for ear and hearing care is a very big book with a lot of information. It is only 70 pages, but I'm not going to go through everything. I will just touch each and every section that is covered in the guideline. It is re its relevance and the objective. And then I will hope that once you get the once you get the guidelines available on the w, on the website for the Ministry of Health in the next one month, then you will be able to discuss and, and you will be able to read and understand what is outlined. So we are going to our book, our guideline, our guidelines are arranged in four major chapters. The first chapter is only outlining the infrastructure that is required for ear and hearing. For purposes of this presentation, I did not write it up. Uh, I was hoping that is mainly for the counties and for the administrators. So for this uh, purpose, I focused on the, the public health interventions, which are uh, described using the acronym hearing. I will go through them one by one and discuss what we have looked at. So the first H for the acronym hearing stands for hearing screening. That means that we aim to undertake various hearing screening programs and with a focus mainly on the newborn and infants, given the, the presentations given before. The aim our, or our main objective for, for, for the hearing screening is that we want to catch the, the or we want to identify it's for early identification and intervention that is going to be early and effective for hearing loss so that we can uh, prevent disability. So we have outlined guidelines for interventions at various fixed points across the life course of individuals. In, of individuals. So we are going to have uh, their guidelines for newborn, for, for newborn screening and infant screening in healthcare facilities and in the community level. There are guidelines for pre preschool and school-based screening programs. And there are guidelines for uh, screening programs of adults who are at risk. These are adults who are mainly receiving ototoxic medication, like adults receiving TB medication, adults on cancer treatment, adults on radiotherapy, and also adults undergoing uh, the who are attending the diabetes and hypertension clinics, because as we know, those are the major non-communicable diseases that directly contribute or indirectly lead to a hearing loss in life. We also have, have outlined guidelines on how to undertake or, or how to do screening for older adults. If we are to take on, we are going to leverage, uh, these guidelines are pegged on, uh, on use utilizing technology to 
to, 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 to do the screening, especially in the community setup and the healthcare setups. So mainly use of mobile phone and smartphone based screening tools that are now currently available and uh, data collection using the same same tool so that we can understand the needs of the population. So these guidelines are well outlined all the way from the role of what can be done in a level six facility, what can be done in a level, in a primary healthcare setup, and what can be done in the community level, including what you can tell the parents what of, of children who have a hearing loss and how they can identify if their child has a hearing loss. The second uh, section or the second acronym of the E is on ear disease prevention and management. So we know that timely and appropriate care of ear diseases leads to prevention of the leads to prevention of um, the permanent disability, which is a hearing disability. Most of these interventions are either preventive or management. As you can see on the table that I have outlined there, the preventive uh, strategies are way more than the management strategies. So that is why we are giving primary health care a uh, priority when it comes to prevention of diseases, because we feel like that is where we can address most of these issues. So we have uh, guidelines on ear hygiene, who should be vaccinated and which vaccines are protective for ear, ear diseases. Uh, timely treatment, how the patients can be referred in good time. Uh, we also have given guidelines on, uh, on, on the implants and devices, policy and law enforcement. Now for this particular topic, we decided because other these other issues such as implants and devices are covered in other chapters, for our topic in the guideline for ear disease and pre prevention and management, we have focused on the basic ear conditions that can be managed in primary healthcare. And we have provided flow charts on how these diseases can be treated with the appropriate dosages of the medications, appropriate, and there are also images of what to expect when you do examination of the ear and how to examine the ear even in the primary healthcare setup, all the way to when you need to refer and where to refer the patient to or whom to refer the patient to. So the A in the, the hearing acronym stands for access to technologies. And um, the, the main objective of this guideline is to ensure adequate rehabilitation and habilitation of people who have um, ear and hearing problems. And we want these devices to be available throughout the life course. We also want to offer Kenyans financial protection. So we have outlined guidelines for stakeholders and, and, and also for the, for the government in, in, order or in order to improve access to hearing aids, access to cochlear implants, and access to hearing assistive technologies and devices. How we did this is that first we started by updating the Kenya Essential Medical Supplies List. It is the one that was released in 20, 2020. Uh, the one that was revised this year, we have updated it and we have included the hearing commodities and the uh, hearing assistive technologies in the list. We have also given an outline on who is to be fitted with what and the uh, and the uh, criteria for with the with the appropriate criteria for who requires what and at what point we have gone ahead and given the technical specifications we have made them available both to kemsa and both in the guidelines so that any person who wants to procure can have can procure the right gadgets with the right technical specifications all the way to how they should be maintained and how they should be taken care of. These guidelines and these technical specifications and instructions on how to take care, they are available uh, for healthcare workers, for the people who are doing the fitting, for the manufacturers who intend to supply these gadgets to the country, and also for the community who are going to be the patient, 
and the family and the caregivers who are going to primarily be taking care of these gadgets but out at home. So it is outlined in a very clear way. And we are hoping to engage NHIF so that we can lay out structures of how to offer financial protection, especially for the very costly devices and implants. So for the for the R, R stands for rehabilitative services. And the main aim of this rehabil the guidelines on rehabilitative services is mainly to optimize the function of people who already have the hearing uh, impairment or hearing disability. The rehabilitation is mainly, as you know, hearing disability is a silent disability and it is also a double disability. If you cannot hear, you cannot talk, meaning you cannot hear, you cannot communicate. So we, we, we are set out guidelines on how rehabilitation should be done through auditory and speech rehabilitation and habilitation programs that are going to serve an individual living with the, with the disability uh, to enhance their communication and their integration and inclusion in the in the in the in the in the community. So we have set out guidelines mainly in the three main areas for the healthcare facilities, how to, to set up an individualized hearing rehabilitative program for an individual, bearing into considerations their environment, their occupation, and also their, their, their community structure. We have also set up guidelines on, um, we have also set up guidelines for, for the basic public facilities on, 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 uh, on how they are going to promote the inclusion of these individuals in the schools and in the basic facilities such as um, in the public offices, in the hospitals, in government offices, so that we can have, uh, we can integrate these individuals who have a hearing loss into the, into the society adequately. For improved communication, I stands for improved communication. Improved communication is going to go hand in hand with the rehabilitation. Once we have these people with a hearing loss adequately rehabilitated, they need to, the public or the society or the, the, the public in general needs to find ways of improving their communication to these people with hearing loss. And so this section is, uh, this uh, section or this topic in our guidelines is mainly focused to facilitate the participation of people who have a hearing disability in all the activities that are relevant in the society across their life course. So we want to create awareness and advocacy for hearing um, loss. We also want to facilitate, uh, to do a lot of counseling, to conduct counseling to patients, to parents, to caregivers, to teachers, so that they can all understand and know how and learn how to communicate effectively with people who have a hearing loss. Things, basic things such as being very slow as you're speaking, uh, being, uh, making eye contact, having contact with those people who have a hearing pro problem to even use of technologies such as captioning devices that can be done. Uh, whenever you're talking to someone with a hearing loss, you can caption the speech and project it in written form on a screen and they can be able to understand. So we also, this chapter also is looking at provision and promoting the provision of basic sign language techniques to community healthcare workers and also to healthcare workers so that we can improve the dignity of people with hearing loss by giving them a one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction whenever they come to healthcare facilities or at least having sign language interpreters stationed so that these people don't have to don't have to feel like they are not accepted in the healthcare facilities and in order to enable them to have access to universal health coverage you said we are mainly doing these guidelines so that we can improve access to healthcare for all individuals. So we also, um, this topic also is, uh, or this chapter is also focusing on um, how we can have more teachers of the deaf trained and deployed into early childhood institutions so that these children with a hearing disability can be rehabilitated while young. The noise reduction, 
is the N stands for noise reduction. This is the biggest elephant currently in the society. We have a lot of noise pollution in our houses from personal listening devices in our entertainment areas from uh, and also at our workplaces for the people who work in areas where there is noise. So the main aim is to cut off noise induced hearing loss, which is a permanent irreversible but preventable form of hearing loss. Prevention is through advocacy, it is also through enforcement of law and policies. So this chapter in our guideline is giving, uh, has highlighted guidelines for hearing conservation programs in the workplaces, both in the, in the formal and in the informal sector. So in the informal sector, we are mainly focusing at Juakali workers. We are focusing at people who work in the matatu industry and in the markets and in other areas where there's a lot of noise. When we are looking at also the hearing conservation programs in the occupation, we have set guidelines for security officers who are armed, both in the army, in the police force, in the administrative, um, in the administrative officers, and also other other licensed. Uh, um, users. So we have guidelines for them. We also have guidelines for school uh, conservation programs, especially on uh, safe listening. And we look, we, are, we have set guidelines on how these programs can be set up and integrated in the community. We believe that if we utilize the school conservation programs through the health belief model, we, we will hopefully raise a generation of people who are aware of the harmful effects of noise and people who are also aware of um, how best they can protect themselves at noise, not when they are young, but also when they grow up and they are in occupations that expose them or whenever they take medications that can expose them to, to, to uh, noise induced, harmful noise induced hearing loss. We have also gone ahead and set up guidelines for um, for, for guidelines for for entertainment venues in especially the things like how the speakers should be spaced, the distance from the speaker between the speaker and the individuals. This is in the aim of making our entertainment venues safe for listeners so that people uh, are able to enjoy the music and at the same time protect themselves for noise from harmful noise and finally we have set guidelines for the civil society and the government and uh, government institutions such as nema the ministry of labor on how best they can implement um, they can implement the the noise uh, or they can mitigate noise induced hearing loss all the way to even noise use noise that is brought about by personal listening devices we have guidelines for the manufacturers in and also for the for for cabs Kenya Bureau of Standards so that they can ensure that people who are importing uh, gadgets, personal listening gadgets and devices, and are able to comply with the World Health Organization and the International Technology Union guidelines on safe, uh, safe listening in these devices. So that when whenever you buy a mobile phone, even if you're not aware that uh, loud sounds can harm your, your can, can be harmful to your ears. Your mobile phone is able to measure the amount of noise that you're exposing yourself to and probably give you a warning when it is time to stop using the gadget. So that is the chapter on noise reduction. I've spent time to explain it because I saw there was a question on how we are uh, planning to, to mitigate that the noise the harmful noise pollution in our environment. And finally, the G is on the greater community engagement. We are uh, trying to implement people-centered, uh, people-centered, integrated people-centered ear and hearing care. So the aim of this chapter is to provide guidelines in how, on how people can change their behaviors and attitudes to Towards hearing loss and its causes across all ages. This one is mainly to reduce stigma. And so this is a chapter that is focusing on how we can do 
advocacy, advocacy, and more advocacy. We are hoping that if we have a people-centered ear and hearing care, we are going to have um, we are going to have uh, ear and hearing uh, services organized around the needs of the individuals who are either at risk of hearing loss or have already have developed that hearing problem. We also want to provide health promotion, disease prevention, and continuum of care all the way from the healthcare, from the from the community setup, all the way to the to the to the highest facility of healthcare. And so this chapter is looking at what will be the outcomes, what will be the individual outcomes, the community outcomes, and 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 the greatest outcome for everyone and for us is, and is the fact that we are going to reduce the burden of people who develop this hearing loss. And by reducing the burden of people who have uh, the hearing disability, we in turn are going to reduce the number of people who have uh, who are dependent in the society and have more productive people who will have a greater contribution economically, socially, in both at the community level, at the family level, and even at, at the national level as a whole. So we will have a more productive uh, nation. And finally, the last topic is a, is a topic on the last chapter of the guideline mainly focuses on monitoring and, and evaluation. And this is a chapter that is for us to give you the evidence of how we came up with the indicators that we are going to come up with and how we came up with the, we, we, it's basically for evidence based, it's for evidence. So we want to also promote research through this chapter, we want to promote research in ear and hearing care. And uh, this is going to help inform the needs of the society and the priority areas in healthcare, especially with focus to ear and hearing care. So it is also, this chapter is also uh, going to give information uh, on advocacy, critical information for advocacy purposes and for re resource mobilization at a partner level, at a community level, at uh, a county level. And it is also going to give the county uh, a design program or a template of how we are hoping that all the counties are going to adopt the monitoring and evaluation framework and the objectives as it is, so that we can be able to review it at the end of the five years of implementing our strategy to inform how best we can strengthen the, the projects that we will have carried out. And any other private, either a private investor or any other donor who would like to start an ear and hearing program, we will be also encouraging them to utilize that so that we can have a basis for a basis for doing an evaluation after the strategy time has lapsed. So that is it for my presentation today. Thank you and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comprehensive um, uh, guideline. It's very nice the way they've done it with hearing. It's easy for us to follow and actually remember. I've just lost my uh, other screens so most of the questions I would not be able to address but maybe the first question would be to Manasseh to help us understand uh, how we can actually put this policy into action who is the focal person and um, where does the task force end or the technical working group where do they end does it does it end at implementation or formulation of the policy Yeah, thank you for the questions. Uh, I am the focal person for ear and hearing care, the Minister of Health, but with the support from Cabinet Secretary, Principal Secretary, Director General for Health, they are all supporting us to make sure that we achieve the terms of reference which are uh, done in my presentation, which are they are also the strategic directions uh, for, for our strategy. Therefore, the technical working group will ensure that we run through these five years, 
to ensure implementation, because that is one of the uh, TOR, uh, to make sure that we disseminate and we implement these uh, strategies. Therefore, our first task is to ensure that we disseminate widely to the health sector. And you, you know the health sector is both public and private. So that is our first task uh, beginning uh, possibly from next month. Uh, we, have, um, uh, we have grouped the counties into six regions, including uh, the national institutions, Kenyatta National Hospital, MTRH, Kenyatta University Hospital, and all the national facilities, including the training institutions, uh, that we shall disseminate this strategy and we move forward together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think that would answer a few of the questions that I had noted earlier on. Um, for uh, Dr. Lee, sorry, so I, I would go back again to you, Manasseh, because uh, it's not common knowledge what TOR is and what is um, a task force. Maybe just in a minute you could explain what exactly you mean by terms of reference and task force, just to, to demystify for some of the members to understand. Okay, uh, terms of reference is like uh, the scope, the scope of the work which the technical working group uh, is supposed to do. Uh, so they are clearly spelled out. We had uh, uh, 11 uh, terms of reference or scope of what we are supposed to do. Scope is what we are entailed to, 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 to do. Therefore, uh, that is what we are calling terms of reference. And in the strategy, we, are, we, are, we have called them strategic directions. So that is what we have been mandated by the ministry to do. So we, are, we, have, we have called them in the strategy as strategic directions. Now, a technical working group, this is a small team of people with some spe special skills. And in this case, our technical group, our working group has got skills in ear and hearing care. Most of the multi sectoral uh, group members that uh, Sarah had alluded to, uh, most of them have got competencies in ear and hearing care. Therefore, they form a technical working group. A task force is usually a big, is, is usually similar to a technical working group, but usually a task force has got um, a, a duration in which they need to work. And uh, from uh, what I know is that as a task force, they are also paid some monetary value, but not, not, not necessarily a, taking work, a technical working group. I don't know whether I've answered the question. Yeah, yeah, you've uh, actually answered uh, the question. And um, so back to Dr. Lillian, um, you talked about the guidelines and how you, how it's supposed to be incorporated and uh, into schools, which is a fantastic idea because it's, it's, it's looking at the education for patient, uh, children who have hearing losses. So someone is asking on the issue of um, if we can introduce sign language teaching in schools. Over to you, Dr. Eric. Dr. Lillian. Maybe Hello? as she... Yes, okay. I can. Okay, sorry. Sorry for that. Um, now, we. it is very nice to introduce, it's a very nice idea to introduce sign language to secondary schools, but we first need to recognize that we don't even have sign language, enough sign language teachers. So as we said, we need to start with training enough teachers in sign language and uh, we can have them deployed in the pre and the, the, the early childhood education centers. And that is the easiest place to start teaching language. And then they can be cascaded up. Also, if we have enough teachers in the, in the, in the 
who are able to train people to speak in sign language, then we can be able to teach to, to teach the students. So we are starting by training the, the healthcare, the, the, the teachers, and we are focusing on the area with the greatest need. I hope I have uh, answered that question. But perhaps when the strategy is being revised, if we notice that we have now trained enough, then that would be the next step to now start training the students in the sign language. Yeah, Dr. Harry, thank you. Um, and on that note, uh, it, it's been mentioned, and this is probably going to Sarah, it's been mentioned severally that prevention is you know, better than cure. And uh, the strategy and the national uh, policy actually covers a lot on public health. But uh, the plan of probably decascading to 290 sub-counties, um, where are we uh, in terms of uh, surveillance? Because I think you've noted uh, in, in the chat box that Kenya is the only hospital, public hospital offering hearing aids. But in terms of just screening and uh, where's the baseline from the situational analysis, Sarah? Uh, thank you for the question. <clears throat> Uh, we are currently at zero. There is uh, no public hospital that is routinely providing a newborn hearing screening. And uh, so that is one of our big priority areas. So it is really, we are going to, of course, when we begin this, because it is a whole process, setting up of newborn screening, for example, is a really all the way from uh, identification. There is a principle we call 136, and uh, means that uh, uh, screening must be done within one month of birth. That is at the time when the child is being delivered from hospital, I mean, they're discharged from hospital or within that one 28 days when they come back for follow-up. So screening for hearing ideally should be done then. And then diagnosis, if a hearing uh, problem, uh, sorry, if they refer, the screening will give you a result of a pass or refer. Means uh, when you're given, when the result is a refer, it means they need to go for onward diagnosis. That diagnosis should happen within three months. And then after that, if a hearing loss is detected uh, and it's the kind of hearing lo loss that requires hearing aids uh, or any other intervention, that intervention should happen within six months at the very latest. So uh, the plan is to start this newborn because there is a continuum of care. For example, those who require hearing aids, they need follow-ups and so forth. We want to select a few counties to begin that. And then uh, especially the, the intervention part, the diagnosis and intervention part to be able then to cascade it downwards. But screening can be done all the way down, you know, to even a community. Sarah, I believe we've lost you. Oh, had I muted? Did you hear me? <laughs> yeah, you. we lost you uh, at the end, just like a minute oh. ago. So uh, what I was saying is that um, for the screening process, we talked about Sarah, we've lost you again. Sorry, so as we wait for Sarah to probably uh, be able to be audible enough, I would uh, quickly ask uh, Manasse, do you have any parting short, something that you'd like to say in two minutes to everybody? Yeah, I want to say that 60% uh, of the ear and hearing uh, 
care conditions are preventable through uh, uh, simple public health interventions. And uh, it's good for all of us to follow preventive measures like avoiding noisy places, going to a noisy dis discourse, noisy matatus, uh, subjecting ourselves to noisy places more than uh, eight hours in a day. It, the, we, we need to avoid that so that uh, we don't destroy our hearing. Thank you. Thank you, very important message. Dr. Lillian? Okay, um, so I hope that I, I think Manasseh has said the parting shot, 60% of these issues can be addressed at primary healthcare. I would only like to highlight one question, which I think I have seen and uh, I think is important. The one that is asking how we plan on implementing the school-based programs. Um, we have a division of adolescent uh, health, of youth and adolescent health in the in the in the in the ministry so through that division of uh, the division of adolescent and school health they have uh, that program is where we plan to peg our implementation of the school based programs we recognize that our ministry of education may not have adequate structures but the school health programs run under this division are already running and they have been running and they are adequate enough to support the ear and hearing care structure. So that is how we plan to implement the school-based screening programs amongst uh, other programs in the schools. But the parting shot is yes, if we put our heads together, if we all work together, it is possible to make uh, ear and hearing care accessible to all Kenyans a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I'll close the session for today. Uh, thank you, listeners, for listening in. Somebody had asked uh, where somebody can register. So we circulate the link online on our KNH Research Twitter handle. So you can quickly uh, try and see there and ask the person to register. And uh, if you're on any WhatsApp forum that most teenage people are, or you are in, you would probably find the PDF whereby you can get into the link. And uh, for the uploaded sessions, we'll make them available on the KMH Research uh, YouTube platform. Uh, for that, thank you very much, everybody, for listening in. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be having a discussion on uh, tuberculosis meningitis by uh, Dr. Farida Esaji. And the moderator would be Dr. Um, Kokinia, Kailenia. Uh, for this uh, session for symposium, we'll be doing the next session next week on uh, on Tuesday, same time. So see you guys again. Bye bye. Asante Nisana.